Hello and welcome to Lecture 9 of Ethics 201, Business Ethics and Corporate Social Responsibility. This is happening in Week 10, um, but it is Module 9, and the tutorial aspects of this lecture happen the following week, uh, which will be Week 11. A little bit different to what I'm what I normally do, where I break the, everything into sort of bite-sized chunks that are quite small with one objective and then some videos. Because this week's lecture sort of has two main foci, foci being the plural of focus, um, I've broken it into two sections. One section that deals with the first three objectives and the other section that deals with the second three objectives. So let's get started. One, as per usual, these are adaptions of the textbook slides and other sources, as I've indicated. The tutorial activities, the objectives, and all the supporting video cases are on the Moodle website. So, on successful completion of the lecture and the associated readings and activities, students should be able to identify some of the issues related to privacy and informed consent when an organisation wishes to monitor or test or evaluate the members of the organisation, identify and discuss the ethical issues associated with personal policies in relation to hiring, promotion, discipline, dismissal and remuneration, identify and discuss the official position on what can, a person can legitimately use for private gain and how one's official condition can be illegitimately used for private gain, I should say, through insider training and access to proprietary data. So that's illegal or illegitimate activity. Identify and discuss the concept of bribery and the factors to be considered in determining the morality of gift giving and receiving in the business context, noting that there's also a legal context that extends not only within Australia, but under Australian laws and under the US laws for that matter, outside of the, each of those countries to other countries and the actions of firms based in say Australia and America and how they operate internationally. Identify how individual self-interests are weighed by the employee facing a tough moral choice and to find and discuss what whistleblowing is and the factors relevant to evaluating its morality. The tutorial reviews these issues. The Moodle forum, you're asked to identify an example of bribery and of whistleblowing, example of each of those, post two or three paragraphs on a real live example. Put the link to the, where you found that information from and also uh, comment on two other students' posts. So one of the reasons for splitting it in this way is as part of the lecture process or the period I would have devoted to the lecture, um, I want you also to consider a little bit about your group assignment and communicate with each other on your group assignment. So our first three objectives, privacy, ethical issues in personal policies, and illegitimate use of an official position for private gain. So, in New Zealand, the privacy legislation allows employee, employers to collect personal information about the employee for a lawful purpose and when that collection is necessary. The Australian legislation is much less stringent than the legislation for New Zealand. And in the Australian leg legislation, you have to focus on informing employees of the purpose for which you're uh, collecting the information, but there's no real limit um, to what information can be collected other than the moral and ethical guidance of the organisation. Um, I don't want to overstate no real limit, but it is much weaker legislation than New Zealand le legislation. To give consent in Australia, that consent must be freely given. It can't be coerced. And it has to rely on free choice. The workers must understand that to which they agree. And it's full ramifications when they consent freely. And consent is only in gain through informed... Consent that is informed is the only valid and legitimate consent. Now, what is formed consent? What is deliberation? What is free choice? Well, almost everybody I know 
has downloaded their because onto their personal device and onto their computer software that they are required to have to do their job, whether it's email, whether it's a personal policy link, whether it's the workplace or some other communication app that they use. Uh, workplace is, a, is the sort of commercial business version of uh, Facebook. All the people download those. Those apps track you. They identify where you are. They can be used because you people normally give consent for the, the firm to control some aspects of your device, um, even clean and erase your entire device, supposedly to protect the organization from privacy and virus threats. I'm not sure most of us would know that that's the permissions we give when we tick yes, the use of those areas, but it is considered informed consent. Personality tests are another areas in which uh, firms, your employer can intrude in your life and ask you things that you would normally consider private. It's argument, argued that these tests screen applicants for jobs by indicating areas of adequacy. It can be used as a de facto and illegitimate tool to um, act as bar barriers to particular socioeconomic or cultural groups. The purpose of a personality test is to simplify the complexities of business life, but they do rely on that questionable assumption that individuals can usefully and validly be, put, be defined race on a small number of categories of personal and character traits, particularly as individuals rarely fall into just one character type and people have different personalities. If you look around, um, universities for example most people who teach in universities most people who work at universities could be defined as introverts because they've been um, encouraged or attracted to research which is a singular process quite often but the act of teaching the act of communication is an extrovert activity so people can pretend to be extroverts or behave in a particular way and many of the other more subtle um, less subtle, more less benign, I suppose, um, parts of personality tests may in fact be used to um, act as a barrier because they have cultural assumptions. Tests are sometimes used to find employees that will just follow the rules or to screen for aspects of organisational compatibility that in themselves may be culturally or ethically biased. There's very little research that backs up the validity and reliability of these tests, nor their appropriateness as an employment screening tools tool. So, but they are widely used. So in your careers, you will undoubtedly be exposed to such personality tests. Second objective deals with how we monitor employees to, uh, to protect property. And that property can, of course, be intellectual property. Now, monitoring raises a range of moral issues. It poses a threat to privacy. It raises questions about informed consent. It can sometimes be used for purposes other than protecting property, it's sort of like stalking. So monitoring controls affects the work-life balance between the employee and the employer. And how much control should the employee employer have on where you are and what you're doing? Particularly out of office hours. Under some industrial agreements and in some legal settings, some settings that are covered by laws and regulation, drug testing is compulsory. But even in that case, informed consent is important. And the consequence of a failed drug test is also important. What is the outcome? Because the tests themselves are not actually particularly reliable. And what do I mean by that? Tests for drugs tend to provide false positives. 
Originally, tests for those type of drugs were designed as screening screening drugs for to be used in emergency environments like the ER section of a hospital or hospital environments or medical settings to indicate whether somebody were who who was under the influence of a particular drug and therefore needed something that would counteract for health reasons the impact of that drug. Whether they needed Narcan, for example, because of the drugs they had taken. They tend to have false positives. In fact, they only are around 85% accurate, the type of swab tests that are used. Much less than the concerns we've had about COVID swab tests, for example. Which we've got concerns above 90 and 95%. Police officers supposedly have training, it's actually about four hours of training, on how to do a, a swab test. So the drug test you do on the side of the road is a drug and booze bus. That's why drug tests get set off for a blood test afterwards because of the lack of accuracy. But I have seen environments where drug tests have been used extensively for screening purpose and if you fail a screening, you don't get offered the job. This is particularly something that occurs within casual employment or within particular industries. And there are other things that give false positives even if a drug is present. It is not present. So all those things influence the reliability of the test, linked to whether or not there's an outcome. Is the interest of the firm sufficient to justify that invasion of privacy? So the mining industry, for example, you go into Santos on the ground floor of their main office, they have, dry, they have an alcohol test in the toilet free alcohol breathalyzer because they've got an organization-wide agreement for alcohol tests. Why do they have that? Drug and alcohol, well, why have alcohol tests on the entrance, but also why do they have drug tests as an organizational agreement? Because of the level of danger of operating in mines. And as part of the industrial agreement, it was applied to all staff, not just people working in the mine, all managerial staff, as well as people working in mine, working in transportation. So tests, but you can see that working in mine, working in transportation, working in the airlines, working in driving trucks, mandatory drug tests or mandatory random drug tests would be a sensible thing to have. So you could see that there can be a justification, but any test should preserve the rights and dignity of the individual. And there are legal constraints that we're not talking about in this ethics-based topic. We're only talking about the, uh, uh, the moral issues rather than the legal issues in this topic. So there's a range of legal... And now, and now it's a sort of contradicts myself. There are, in fact, laws that cover... Um, and there are anti-discrimination laws that should be abided by in an HR setting, and those are listed on the Fair Work Ombudsman site. We can see them. You've obviously dealt with them in the HR topic. So, but beyond those personnel policies and procedures that are defined by the law, there are also a number of things that influence the basic relationship between the organisation and the employees. Employees need to be treated with trust and respect. Organisational policies and procedures should uphold those ideals. You should be ethical and equitable in your hiring to treat applicants fairly in the screening and the end of telling people what the nature of the job is, the specification, avoiding unfair discrimination. And if you are going to use tests, whether they're personality or attributes or skills or abilities tests, they should be reliable and valid. There are issues in promoting on seniority rather than the most qualified. There are issues about what employees expect and whether long serving is in fact something that creates an ethical entitlement to be promoted beyond the performance. Those are cultural issues within the organisation. There's issues related to nepotism 
in family-run businesses, in employment of friends and relatives, the exclusion of friends and relevant uh, and relatives from firms. So, is it any be- if if is it ethical for a husband and wife not to be employed in the same firm because of fear of risk of nepotism if they are? We need to treat people in de- with dignity in relation to the feedback we give them, the private and public advice we give them, and how we give performance eva- uh, evaluation. We need to avoid immediate dismissal, except in particular cases where there is a clear line set in the employment contract versus graduated steps in disciplinary processes. We need to have just cause. How do we deal with off-the-job conduct? To what extent does off-the-job conduct, well, should off-the-job conduct relate to on-the-job performance and whether or not you're employed or promoted? How is the person notified? I mean, we saw just a week ago Uber dismissing people in a three-minute Zoom call for three or four thousand. I thought it wasn't three or four thousand. It was six thousand people on that Zoom call. All of them in that three-minute Zoom call were told that they no longer had a job. Because of the economic downturn through COVID, I know academics who have lost their jobs over Zoom. I also know people that have been dismissed by text. All of which, much of which doesn't represent treating people with dignity. And you need to comply with notice and severance pay requirements in the employment contract. We need to comply with the law, the community wage level, the nature of the job, job security and what are the prospects, employee financial capabilities and, and how the employees in, in doing employable roles in the organisation relate to each other when we're setting wages, when we're paying people. We need to treat people ethically. So those are the things that cover our first two objectives. The last thing I want to talk about before we uh, have a break is the third objective, which deals with a range of issues related to the conduct you have in the in an organisation um, on on your official pr- principle and self. Um, say that sentence again. In relation to your official position and the contribution that that official position makes to your own position in the organization now what do i mean by that i want to discuss things like private gain insider trading and access to proprietary data and intellectual property so in the media this week we see that the ig the inspector general of the state department has just been sacked his role is to investigate Official misconduct in the State Department of the U.S. The president has just moved him aside. He was investigating the Secretary of State, i.e. the most senior minister in the State Department, the boss of the State Department, in relation to misusing funds because of the place he was flying to, back to Kansas, while he was considering running for election back in Kansas using official flights and also a range of more, or apparently more minor, but, in, but equally wrong, use of security and business staff to do personal errands for him and his partner, his wife. That's an abuse of official position. But there are other ways you can abuse your official position. Misuse company funds. Is sort of what I just said about flying back and forth between to your hometown using private, they're using uh, making a private trip for public, on public expense, on business expense. 
insider trading. Again, we've seen several uh, people being investigated in the US par- Parliament, um, but the US Congress and Senate related to insider trading in which they've changed their investment profile after being briefed on the Im- likely impact of COVID. Buying shares in online, selling shares in bricks and mortar stocks, buying shares in particular pharmaceutical companies, selling shares in transportation. And the use of proprietary data like trade secrets, like patents, like copyright is an abuse of official um, position. So who's an insider for insider trading? Well, anybody that has inside in information. Information that's not publicly disclosed. Misappropriating sensitive information that has an indirect harm to outsiders, creating something that's not a level trading field in which investors are likely to put off investing um, is an impact of insider trading and it undermines the fiduciary duty between the management of the business and the owners of the business and the broader stakeholders of the business that is essential in management. Patents are legally protected but may not be secret. Well, are not secret because patents are registered. You can look at anyone's patent. Information cannot be used by others without permission for the life of the patent or copyright. And such devices are defended against accusation of a violation of free market principles of the ground that without them, no investment will be made in these type of new inventions. So patents are so making copies, using other people's intellectual property, using other people's patents is important. Any formula, pattern, device, compilation, formulation in the business, it can be trade secrets, trade secrets to the intellectual property of the company. Theft of trade secrets is unfair competition, and if an employee discloses trade secrets, they violate their confidentiality agreement with the organisation and therefore are at risk of um, impacting on... Or risk of impacting are at risk of breaking the moral relation, the ethical relationship they have with their employer. Okay, as I said, I was going to go through and deal with some of these, and then at the end of dealing with some of these, I was going to stop and come back and look at the second part of our topic, which looks at the second group of issues related to whistleblowers and bribes and kickbacks. So that's what we will look at in the second part of the lecture. There's several videos to look at that discuss the issues we've dealt with so far.